Okay, so let's uh, continue to talk a little bit about this idea of uh, the company concentrating on the profits and then this just generally helping society. So how can we link profits and social welfare? So <coughs> individual preferences define the advantage for the individual. And here the collective advantage is the sum of the individual advantage. So if everybody is an entrepreneur working making profits, then the collective can have more money. Okay? People only do things that they think is in their own interest. So if we are working for, for ourselves, we'll maximize our individual situation. So if we have three people, A, B, and C, right? We're all working for ourselves, so I'll get the maximum, I'll get the maximum, and I'll get the maximum. Add these three lines together, we get this right, collectively. Whereas if in the other case it says that we're all working for the same line, maybe we all work slowly. So it's just here. So we don't make as much profits as we would have made if we were all working for ourselves. Right? So that's this idea. So <coughs> the problem is that in some cases my happiness can't be increased without the other person having a problem, right? So my profits, if I keep increasing my profits, maybe this person might have a problem, or this person might have a problem, right? Might cause problems for somebody else. <coughs> so under this idea, the job of managers is very specific. They, they do what they're good at, which is matching products and services to the customers who are willing to pay the most for them. This satisfies the customer. The customer is happy. Okay? Shareholders are happy. They get a return on their investment. And successful companies attract more capital. They get more investment. And they pay taxes, provide jobs. Okay? So they think that this helps the collective preference. Customers are helped because they're getting what they want at a good price, competitive price, right? We don't have competition, what's going to happen to the price for customers? What's going to happen to the price for customers if we don't have competition? Hmm? Higher, right? Does globalization mean lower or higher prices for customers? Hmm? So, for example, the German supermarket comes to Ireland, starts competing with the Irish supermarket. Are the food prices going to go up or down in Ireland? Down. Down, down right? So, the globalization, that kind of globalization, it can be better for consumers, right? I can buy jeans for very cheap because they are produced in Vietnam. Okay? <laughs> if that was produced in Ireland, it would be more expensive. Okay? So we have the open competition and between these people and then the customers get the best price because of the open competition. Okay? Shareholders are happy they're making a profit. Okay? So we're keeping uh, some parts of people happy. And they, according to this, the collective preference satisfaction is maximized. Also, the local community is happy because they're getting the taxes to pay for education and so on. Okay. So, according to them, managers should focus on this job because that's what managers are good at. Managers are good at making profits. Okay? But he says managers are not the correct people to solve society's problems like crime or poverty. Managers have no training or expertise in that area. Managers will not allocate resources efficiently due to favoritism. So he thinks that managers shouldn't be socially responsible that much because they're not the right people to do that. They don't know about how to solve the society's problems. Okay? 
And if they do give money, maybe they're going to give money to the wrong people. Okay? They're just going to give money to their friends or their favorite one. Maybe their wife had a heart attack. So they give money for research for heart attacks. Okay? Because their wife had that problem. <coughs> so they're not properly doing the charity. They don't have the skill to do that. And also they could be doing favoritism. So he, according to him, managers in companies shouldn't be thinking about that. They're not qualified. They might use favoritism. So we can see that some of the things that Friedman are saying are making sense, right? But there are some problems with this idea. So he doesn't explain why companies should avoid fraud and deception. If companies are just thinking about profit, right, and keeping the law, why, why should they not do some kind of fraud or deception. He doesn't explain that well, right? It may be that if I do some fraud, I get away with breaking the law and nobody knows, I can make more profit, okay? Friedman's <coughs> ideas on preferences also is being criticized, these ideas about preferences. It's his I idea, philosophical idea, but other philosophers argue with that. Uh, this idea of focusing on profitability for the owners means that managers think in the short term. They don't think in the long term. So it can actually even be worse for the company in the long term, or profits in the long term. Just focusing on the stock price or the short term can be a problem. And then lastly, managers have shown that they can be effective at helping with society problems. So managers, they're not completely useless at doing social things. <clears throat> so the first problem, focusing on short-term success. So under this model, companies are not looking forward to consider long-term opportunities and risks. An example is water. Do you think the price of water is going to go up or down in, in the future? Oh. Right. Is the government going to make more laws or more taxes? Right. Probably. So a company which is using a lot of water now, just following the law, they could get a surprise in two or three years. Suddenly, the price of water goes up, their profits go down. Right. But they weren't thinking about that because they were thinking about just now, my profit now. But a company which is going further than the law, they already set up environmentally friendly system. So they don't use much water. Okay? Instead of water, they use some other system or other way. It's more expensive, but they want to help the environment, so they made this system. So after two or three years, the government increased the price of water a lot. This company is okay. Anyway, they're not using water. Okay? So even the company can be damaged by focusing too much on the short term. The company needs to think about the long term too. So these days it's considered poor management, just focusing on the profit. Okay? So a balanced scorecard is another alternative. A uh, balanced scorecard means that we're looking at not just the finance, we're also looking at some other ways. Okay? We'll explain later. This focusing on short-term success is also given as a reason for the financial crisis. So we looked at the video about the financial crisis and we saw that uh, Obama was talking about a culture of, of arrogance, culture of greed on Wall Street, right? If I was working in the bank, my, the stock price in the bank went up in the short term, right? Because we sold all these mortgages and we made all this profit this year. But what's going to happen next year? Or five years later, people can't pay back the mortgage. So it's not good for the bank in the long term. But in the short term, it was good. The stock price went up. The owners made a profit, right? Especially the manager got a big bonus. So in the financial crisis, there's the story of the managers who made a big bonus, right? Hundreds of millions of dollars in 2006, 2007. And then they just left their job in 2008. But they have hundreds of millions of dollars. Are they worried that much about losing their job? Oh, they already got the bonus payment because they were looking at the short term. 
right? Maybe their bonus was set up the wrong way, just for a short-term performance. So the short term, can, we can run into problems like this financial crisis, just thinking about the short term. So let's have a look at another example of a criticism of this theory. So this is an example of Ford Pinto. Do you know Ford? Car maker. Car maker, right? So the Pinto was a type of car that they made. So it was a small car. They wanted to compete with the foreign automakers. So they accelerated the production. They made the production very quick. So the product development and the tooling, tooling means uh, setting up the car, happened at the same time. They were still developing their product while they were working on building the product. Okay, they had some crash tests. Do you understand crash test? The car goes into the wall, right? It showed there was a problem in the gas tank. Gas tank is where we put petrol or gas. So Ford made a cost-benefit analysis. It would cost 45 million to pay compensation to people who had a problem, and 137 million to fix the flaw. So if the company is only thinking about profit, which one are they going to do? Pay 45 million in compensation later, after the customer has the problem, or pay 137 million now? Pay 45 million later. Later, right? If we're only thinking about profit, we'll say, okay then, let's, let's just release the car with this problem, then somebody has a problem with the gas tank, then we just pay them some compensation, right? It's easier. So they made that decision not to fix the flaw or the problem. So, uh, what happened? is that there was some accidents and fires and some people died, right, because of this decision. And in the end, Ford had to pay a lot more than $137 million in compensation to the victims. And also the company lost the reputation. Okay? So we can see that it's kind of an ethical decision. You give somebody the faulty product, they can even die in an, in an accident in that case. Okay? And it could be worse. So this is one criticism of only thinking about pro profit, right? We could have an unsafe product. We can see many examples of this kind of thing. In China, we saw some milk for babies a couple of years ago, which had some chemical, because it was saving money to put the chemical instead of the real milk, and then a lot of kids died, right? So if the company is just thinking about profits, we can have that sort of situation. On the other hand, we have Johnson & Johnson. Do you know Johnson & Johnson? Yes. What kind of things do they make? Russia, baby lotion. Baby lotion. Mm. Aspirin. Aspirin. Shampoo, that kind of thing. So they, have, they had a different idea than Ford at that time. They had a long-term outlook. Their idea is customers come first and shareholders last. So they think it's the other way around. They flip it the other way around. They think First of all, if we look after the customers, then everything else will follow. So instead of making our objective profits, let's make our objectives the customers are happy. Then if the customers are happy, then the profits will follow, right? And the society will benefit, and so on. So they made, uh, they're more interested in the long-term outlook. So what about the data? The data supports a positive link between companies' commitment to ethics and social responsibility and financial performance in the long term, not in the short term, right? Ethics and social responsibility spending cost more money in the short term. But over the long term, generally, the company who does that kind of uh, thing can build up their reputation and can perform better. So, are managers bad at social issues? They're not experts at social issues, but they're not that bad either okay, in the company. Mm, they, work, they can work with the other stakeholders, especially with NGOs, right, to advise them. They can get advice from other people. So, they can 
it's possible that they can make good decisions about the social issues. Right? So Ford currently, Ford has changed, right? That was back in the 60s or 70s. They now say that they have never lost sight of the social and environmental goals that are key elements of business. So now Ford thinks these social and environmental goals are key elements. So what does Ford do about that? They have a Ford Global Week of Caring, Ford Dreams, Automotive Industry Action Group, they organize inside the industry. So these are kind of things they're doing, right, for the society or so on, nowadays. <clears throat> the US financial institutions have launched MoneyWise, free financial education. So these kind of things are making a difference. So it shows that managers, sometimes managers can make good decisions. They can help with the, with the society. So let's discuss these three questions to check our understanding. What narrow measurement does the neoclassical models suggest that managers focus on? How can we link, or how does the neoclassical model link profits and social welfare? And then what are the criticisms of this theory? So discuss these questions with your partner. Can you go on to the next one? Can you come out to here? Managers focus on what's the only thing that managers should think about. The first question. Neoclassical model managers only focus on profits. Okay, so the key word is profit, right? Just the company should make profits. Just think about profits. Then uh, the next question, uh, Kim Weijin. How can we link? How do they link profits and social welfare? If somebody asks more than Freeman, if you only focus on profits. How is that helping social welfare? What is he going to say? Mm -hmm. <coughs> I'm just like Friedman because like I'm just focusing on profits, nothing else. Or I don't know if I can give reason on that. Yes, but if you just focus on profits, how are you helping society? Of course, the GDP is going to increase by my company because I can develop the environment. 
So yeah, the GDP increases because you create jobs and produce things. Yeah. Yes. That's it. So you all, in that way, you also pay taxes, right? Oh yeah. Pay taxes, so you help the country, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. So we saw another couple of things mentioned here, just to remember, right? So we had this idea: just if everybody works for themselves, we can end up with a higher collective value, right? And customers can get also, customers can be happy because each company is trying to make the lowest price, maybe, to make the best profit, right? So, those kind of arguments. So then the next question, what are the criticism? E. Uh, J. What are the criticisms of this theory? What's the problem with this theory? Damage the environment. Weak people can identify the weak people can identify by the business. Okay. Other criticisms? We saw an example of the Ford Pinto. So in the extreme situation, people could even die, right? Only thinking of the profits, right? So uh, we can see that companies should focus more on the long term, right? So the main criticism is they're just focusing on the short term. They're just thinking about the short term when there could be bad effects in the long term. And we saw that some people blame this kind of thinking for the uh, Enron, we saw, or the financial crisis, right? So, <clears throat> another approach is stakeholder management. This is the more popular approach these days, okay? Uh, stakeholder management was first thought of in the 1980s by R.E. Friedman. Sounds like Milton Friedman, but slightly different name, right? They're not brothers. How managers should identify and align the interests of a wide range of individuals and groups. So we're not just thinking about our owners, right? So, but some people have criticized this one. They say it's anti-capitalistic, should be an I here. Right? You understand capitalism? Mm -hmm. Capitalism won, right? Communism lost. <laughs> we talked about the story in the US, but we also had this experiment in the world after World War II. We had the USSR and their sphere of influence, which was a communist. And we had the US and their sphere of influence, which was capitalist. And in the communism, they used the idea of Karl Marx, right? Yes. But Karl Marx's ideas, he had a lot of wrong ideas. And one of his wrong ideas was that human nature would change after we made a socialist system. But human nature didn't change. Right? People were still the same. We still had people who wanted to be at the top and keep the other people at the bottom. Right? So these days, most systems are some combination of capitalism and socialism. Even the US, before the, the First or Second World War, the US didn't have any social welfare. But now they have social welfare. So the US has some introduced some social things, right? And then China is introduced the free market system, right, to its economy. So some mixture. In my opinion, I think Norway and Sweden has the best mixture. Mixture. Sorry, Denmark, very close, but <laughs> not as good as Norway and Sweden, right? Norway and Sweden has about uh, very good social services, right, like uh, free transport and healthcare and so on. And at the same time, it's a very developed economy with the high GDP. So in my opinion, they have the right mix, right? Better, even better than the US okay? between the two systems. But that's just a side point. But also we can see a lot of these ideas of social responsibility and so on coming from Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. For example, uh, 
uh, companies have to make some uh, financial accounts for the stock market every year, right? But in Scandinavia, they've also started that companies have to report about their social and environmental things, right? The first area in the world where companies have to also make another report by law, not just a financial report, but also that by law they have to make a report on their social and environmental impact, okay? So that could probably will spread out to other countries as the time goes on. So anyway, this system is seen a little bit as anti-capitalistic. It doesn't provide an objective corporate function. So it's not clear. With profits, it's very clear what the company is focusing on. But this one, it's not so clear. I have a lot of different competing interests. Okay? And maybe the manager can use some kind of favoritism is another criticism. So they prefer some group or some individual. So managers are only human. So they can also make mistakes. <coughs> so we mentioned the balance scorecard and the triple bottom line were other things which we are not going to focus on, right? We are going to focus on this stakeholder management. But let's just mention them, right? There's a link here for the Economist magazine, so we should just be familiar with what we're talking about. So do you understand bottom line? Bottom line is at the end, we do all our accounts, income, cost, right? Income minus cost, right? Minus tax, right? Then the bottom line is at the very end. Okay, but they're saying we don't need just the bottom line for Finance. We also need a bottom line for something else and something else. Okay, not just the profits, not just the finance. So we need a, a triple bottom line. He, he said this in 1994. Okay, so the normal bottom line is the profit and loss account. This is profit and loss. That's the normal bottom line. Okay. So the second one, this one, is going to be people. This is called the people account. This is the second one. So, how socially responsible was the organization for people, like social? This is also called a social. And the last one is environment. So, you're measuring things like, here, are we training our workers? How many women are in the high position in our company? Okay, people, people score, that kind of thing. Environmental score. So, com company is rated not just on financial performance, but also on people and environment. Okay, so the triple bottom line has three P's. Profit, people, and planet. So only a company that reports on these, has these three lines, is doing business well. So, <coughs> it's quite similar, in fact, to the uh, uh, balance scorecard, which we'll talk about next. So as I say, these ideas, they're good ideas, right? But they're not the one we're focusing on in the class. We're focusing on stakeholder management, which is uh, nowadays seen as the better choice, okay? But they're similar in some ways. So the next one is the balanced scorecard. <coughs> so. Okay, so the balance scorecard is, is quite uh, similar to the, just it's not letting me see at the moment, <coughs> so you can check in more detail yourself. But the balance score, uh, do you, do you, did you ever play golf or bowling? You have a scorecard, put in your score, right? So a balance scorecard means the company just gives itself a score for all of these different things, okay, right? We're mainly talking about people, environment, governance, right? So we get a score for each thing and we we think about all of those things when we're making our decisions, okay? So we, in this case we're thinking about people and environment. Balance scorecard a little bit wider, okay, or a bit more detailed. And getting on to stakeholder management, we're not just thinking about these things. Stakeholder management, we're consulting with everybody, 
all of our stakeholders, right? And trying to match up their interest. So we have another one, long-term wealth production. So these are ideas which were proposed by people in the 90s, usually in the 90s. So nowadays, effective stakeholder management is seen as essential for long-term company value and success. So serving all your stakeholders is the best way to produce long-term results and create a growing, prosperous company. There is no conflict between servicing all your stakeholders and providing excellent return for, for our shareholders. In the long term, it is impossible to have one without the other. So he thinks that thinking about long-term value for the shareholders, we keep our stakeholders happy. We saw in Johnson & Johnson's case, who do they want to keep happy? Customers. Customers, so that's also quite narrow. So in this case, this guy is talking about keeping the customers happy, the NGOs happy, the suppliers happy, the employees happy, right? The stockholders happy, keeping everybody happy, all of the stakeholders. And if we can do that, then in the long term, we will make more profit. Can you understand that idea? <clears throat> so, first of all, we have to identify who are our stakeholders. This is the first step. Okay. So, like I said, we're learning a framework. You could be working in any industry. But they all use this general, <coughs> general framework. Which is, first of all, identify who are your stakeholders. So, here's the definition of stakeholder. Any individual or group whose claim on a firm's activities could promote or inhibit company value creation and ultimately company success. So, this is kind of official definition, right? We can say just anybody who has something to do with a company or who is affected by a company. So, we have to see uh, our specific stakeholders. Are they short-term stakeholders or long-term? Right? Each group makes a different type of claim on the company. So, for example, employees, they want higher wages. Shareholders, they want to get more profit. In the short term, is giving our employees higher wages going to mean that our shareholders will get more profit or less profit? Less profit. Less profit in the short term. So there are complete conflicting interests, right? In the long term, what do you think? It's not so sure, right? In the long term, if we increase our employers' wages, employees' wages, they might decide to stay in the company rather than leave the company, right? And we might make more profit in the long term too. Okay? But in the short term, it's conflicting. Activist groups like might complain about the environment or global warming. So they are asking our company to do less pollution, to be better towards the environment. So every group has a different type of claim on the company. So after we've done this, uh, we make a table, right? Stakeholder, 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 stakeholder. Claim, 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 claim. Claim means what do they want? Okay? Claim is what do they want. So we have this table. So in principle, if we meet the stakeholder's claim, it adds value. And we should do this. Okay? If we keep our stakeholders happy, it's going to be better for our company, in principle. So we should do this. So for example, our suppliers, they always want to get paid on time. If we don't pay them on time, are they going to be happy? No, right? What can happen if our suppliers are not happy? What could happen if our, we have a bad relationship with our suppliers? They're not happy. 
they could break the contract, right? Anything else? They could give us some poorer quality product. They use lower quality material. Give us a poorer quality product. They don't care as much. So in theory, we have to try and keep meet all of their claims, what they want. Okay, if we don't, if our workers want a higher wage and we don't give our workers a higher wage, what might they do? What could be the negative thing? The workers ask us for a higher wage, but we don't give them a higher wage. Strike. They could be on strike, yeah? Or they could just not work hard, right? They could just stop working hard. So it, we should meet our stakeholders' claims to get more advantage for the company. So it adds social capital. Social capital is called, it's like trust. Do you understand trust? We build up social capital with our stakeholders. They trust us. So it's a capability that arises from the prevalence of trust in a society. If people who work together in an enterprise trust each other, because they are all operating on the same ethical norms, doing business costs less. So if I trust you, we don't have to do as much, make as many contracts, right? Or we can do things easier, right? So for example, I don't have to bring the camera back to my office every time. I trust that you know the camera is also for your benefit, so you're not going to steal the camera, right? <laughs> right? <coughs> you're not answering? <laughs> so, <clears throat> if we have trust, it means we don't have to do certain things, right? So we can get some advantage because we have a good relationship or trust with our stakeholders. Sometimes the stakeholders don't make a claim. Maybe the workers don't want to ask for higher wages because they're afraid that they could get into trouble, right? Or they don't get a promotion. Or maybe our suppliers don't ask because, again, they're afraid we'll change the supplier. So, anyway, we should try and figure out. We should try and figure out what is their claim. And we should try and do what's best for them, too. So, for example, improving our workplace health and safety or educating employees can boost company performance. So we fi can figure out what claims employees have. For example, we, there was some company that found out by putting some plants in the office, they increased the worker productivity. Right? The workers didn't ask for more plants, but the company figured out that they have this need or claim, they should have more plants in the office, it's nicer. And then after this, the workers' productivity increased, right? They work better. Or we improved their health and safety in the workplace. Educating, give them more education. It can boost the company performance. Two, they're happier in the company and they work better and work harder. <clears throat> so th that's the first step. Identifying our, the claim of every stakeholder and trying to meet the claim. Later we'll talk about what happens when we have conflicting claims that we can't meet the two together, right? They're directly conflicting. The second step is improving what a stakeholder can achieve, for example, through education. In order to generate valuable outcomes and mutually drive company success. So we move from all stakeholders to a group called mutual stakeholders. Mutual stakeholders if they improve, our company improves. Okay? They have a shared or joint interest in the company's success. So improving them, developing their capabilities, help drive the company's success. So if we improve the ability of the NGO, is that helping company success? Not really, right? It's not that big relationship of improving the ability of the NGO about the environment, which is a global issue, and our company improving its performance. So they're not really a mutual stakeholder. Mutual stakeholders, we're talking more about employees, suppliers, okay? Mainly employees and suppliers, but also consumers and shareholders, okay? For example, consumers, if we're selling financial products they don't understand, if we give them some financial education, then they can buy more of our product. 
right? Suppliers. <coughs> the Asian culture is very famous for helping their suppliers. It's different than in the US. For example, Toyota. You know Toyota? Toyota has a different relationship with their suppliers than, say, Ford or GM in the US. Ford or GM in the US, they try to get the suppliers to compete with each other. All right? And then choose the supplier with the lowest price. But in the Japanese culture, it's a little bit different, right? Maybe more similar to Korean culture, which is, we want, so often they invest in the supplier. They buy some stocks in the supplier, so they have ownership interest called cross-holding and also they try to help the supplier develop the supplier because it's in their interest if the supplier gets better then their quality of their material is better then our company does better right so for example Toyota had just-in-time production have you heard of just-in-time production yes can you explain what it is is the day assemble the car at the last possible moment? Yes. So? So they, so they save money, right? They're not keeping a lot of parts in the warehouse. Okay? They do things just in time. This bit gets ready, goes here. So we don't have to pay to store it in between. So this is a good system, right? Should we teach this system to our suppliers? Yes or no? Keep it a secret or teach to our suppliers? Why? Okay, they can develop better, they can sell a better quality product at a lower price, right? So Toyota works with its suppliers. The engineer from Toyota goes to the supplier's factory for six months, okay? Teaches the suppliers what to do. The engineer from the supplier's factory comes to Toyota for six months and they learn about Toyota systems and they help their supplier. So that is improving the capability of my supplier. Is that going to be more profit for my company? Yes, right? Better quality supplies and lower price. Uh, employees, that's very clear. If I increase the ability of my employees capabilities, then my company should do better. Okay. Shareholders, they can understand more about the business. They can make better decisions. Consumers can make better choices. So let's have a look at example. So nowadays, the US companies like Ford are trying to follow the Japanese system. They realized that the US system didn't work well. It's one of the things about globalization. We can learn from the other countries and the other systems, right? It's not the case that the US is always right. Okay? And the US is just teaching all the other countries how to do their way. Okay? But the US can also learn from other countries. So the US is learning from Japan. So uh, Ford is now working with its suppliers and industry partners to encourage the development and implementation of environmental management systems. Environmental management system, you can get uh, some certificate, right? It means that you are managing, making sure that you're not doing too much pollution, you're not using too much energy, you're not using too much CO2, that kind of thing, right? Tooling analysis is a technical thing. So, Ford now working with their suppliers. Capital One, financial company. Increasing the financial literacy of people with the low education in the, in the areas where people don't understand well. So, for example, some people don't understand well about credit cards. They don't really understand how the credit card works. So, they, do, they might not pay back the credit card, and then they have 18% interest the next month, right? So, we want to make them more financially literate. Deutsche Bank is a bank which also does community arts, music, and edu educational programs. So, by educating their consumers, the consumers can also <coughs> understand better about their product, right? Give them some general education about finance, and they can buy more of the product. 
So these are examples of improving the uh, capability of our mutual stakeholders, right? Not all our stakeholders, just mutual stakeholders. So these are two steps in stakeholder management. First of all, <coughs> help all stakeholders by understanding and meeting their claims. They'll be happier. We build this kind of uh, social capital or trust, good relationship. Business is better for everybody. Help our mutual stakeholders by developing their capabilities. They get better at doing their things. It helps us as a company. So, let's discuss uh, the first three questions here with your partner. Who is a stakeholder of a company? What are the two steps? I just said the two steps. What are the two steps of stakeholder management? And give an example of how we can improve our mutual stakeholder. Right? There are a lot of stakeholders. Anybody who has an interest in the company. Number two, uh, <coughs> Huang Esther. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what are the two steps okay. of stakeholder management? Understand their claims or meet their claims? Understand and meet their claims, right? If we can. The second step? Develop their capabilities, right? So then, Kim uh, Sang Hui? Yes. The third question, can you give an example of how we can improve our mutual stakeholders' capability? Education. Education, right. Who? Who are we going to educate? OK, 
Okay, anybody? Who are we going to educate? Employees. Employees. Right. Could you give an example of educating the employees? Okay, teach them some new technique, right? that kind of thing. That's the, the clearest way. Okay, so then let's uh, finish there for today. So, see you in the next class. So, if you remember, if you want to read about this, uh, on the Harvard Business website, there is the uh, download. You can pay just four dollars for the chapter one. Right?